This is James Duffy from TSN, and you are listening to Tobin Tonight. First thing I'm going to ask, how's it going? How's uh, Jay and Dan and the, the new setup going over there? I don't speak with Jay and Dan, so I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, no, there it's going good. It's going good. It's great to have those guys back. You know, twice they said they'd have me on the show, made me stand around, and then bump me from the show, very much like Jimmy Kimmel does to Matt Damon. So I'm a little hurt by that, but uh, no, it's there. It, it's it's fun to have those guys around. Well, I mean, you can do the same thing to them. You invite them on your Rubber Boots podcast, and uh, no, that you know, will never happen. No, no, no. Uh, actually, speaking of the Rubber Boots podcast, how's that going as well? It's going great. It's it's been a lot of fun. It's I, I didn't really know what I was getting into. I think you and I might have talked about this last year. I really didn't know anything about podcasting. I'd never listened to a podcast before. I'd been on a couple, but I'd literally been on way more podcasts than I'd ever listened to. But it, it, it's a lot of fun. TV is is so structured in in what we do, and we only have a few seconds here or there, especially when you're the host. So to be able to sit around with buddies and talk for as long as you want about whatever you want, I think is a lot of fun. And uh, some of the stuff that we've developed, I, I know not all your listeners maybe listen, but, you know, Rod Smith, the character of Rod Smith on the podcast is a little different from Rod Smith in real life. And he now has a sidekick named Emilio, and it's just the stupidest stuff ever, but we have a lot of fun with it. But, like, the benefit of it is that we get to see another side of you that, you know, you don't see on TSN as uh, uh, when you're doing that hockey. Right, and I, I probably share more than I, I, I should if my boss is listening. I don't think they listen yet, so as soon as they listen, I'll probably be in trouble. But uh, you're right, it's fine. And uh, I mean, the great thing about podcasts, you, you find your own niche, which I'm sure you have. And, you know, Jay and Dan were way ahead of the curve on that. They've been doing this for, I don't know, six years or something. And Bob and I are still newbies who've only done it for less than a year. But it is something different, and... It's going to be. It's obviously a little more niche audience than the mainstream things of people watching hockey games. You're never going to get a million people listening to your podcast, but that's okay. And you know, people constantly tell me, "Well, you need to do this and this to make it more uh, appealing to the masses." But I don't really want it to be appealing to the masses. I don't care about that. I, I, I've always been the kind of guy that if 10 percent of the people really liked the joke and the others didn't get it, well, that that made me happy for those 10%. So I kind of feel the same way about the podcast. It's not going to appeal to everybody, but I think the people that do like it will like it a lot. We've we've had a a discussion in the past, and we've had you on our, uh, we did the trade deadline special, and I was thinking even coming in here, I'm like, I don't really want to recreate that same interview, but at the same time, because it's season two and you got your own special here right now, we can kind of (laughs) go into that kind of spectrum a little bit. So I, I want to get into that side of it, too, because you mentioned about, you know, you don't want a whole mass audience, but you're happy with creating your own niche. Now, I feel like you have that niche on the TSN, like, because, you know, with Sportsnet having the hockey rights now, right. there's there's still people that watch TSN just for strictly watching you and Bob and you know that's what they tune into the last time we talked you also mentioned about you gotta kind of find the line of when to be serious and when to be funny how do you find do you do you still find that a struggle to do that even when you're doing the show I I don't think it's a struggle I think maybe I er, er, years ago I I struggled that I think I've sort of found my comfort zone on on how to do that I don't think on TV you know, it's different. When, when Jay and Dan, their show is really about two things. It's highlights, but also having as much fun with them as possible. And so I think they can pretty much go full bore. I've always felt like because of the roles that I do, if I'm hosting the Olympic Games or if I'm hosting the Grey Cup or whatever it may be, there's there has to be some sort of seriousness to me a little bit. So if I was out there trying to be funny every time that my face was on TV... Well, A, that would get a little bit annoying, and B, how would you people ever take me seriously? So I, I definitely try to pick my spots. Now, the podcast is different because, again, we can do whatever the hell we want, and I, I think there are fewer rules with that. So I, I, I don't think that's really a struggle anymore. You know, I don't really try to be funny on TV anyway. We have some good banter with the, with the guys on the panel, but 
most of the time I'm just being the host role and getting from A to B and trying to provide some entertainment for people with, but I, I'm not out there doing stand up. Yeah. Sure. It's, it's like, you're not, you're, when we tune in, we're not watching a uh, James Duthie with like a clown nose on or, uh, the, no, or a wig. You know, I've always said that, that if you look, if people say you're funny, that's great. But the standards for comedy on, on a, a television sports show are much lower than they would be if you're watching Jim Kimmel or Jimmy Fallon or uh, somebody in a stand-up act, right? So I think people, people, you sometimes get laughs because people, again, their comedy standards are, are way lower. But if you try to do that too much, then I think you're setting yourself up to be, A, a failure and for people to want to punch you in the face. No, that's, that's fair. I've been punched in the face a couple times. <laughs> I'm sure there's been people that have wanted to punch me in the face. I mean, we all go over the line sometimes, but uh, hopefully mm, the majority of the time you stay on the right side of it. Now, the, the other thing that I want to mention about, because we haven't talked about this in the last special, but, you know, you came out with two books. I've read both of them. Uh, I want to ask you first, why did you choose the name uh, The Day I Almost Killed Two Gretzkys? <laughs> That's a good question. And I don't even know that I know the answer, Brian. That was an odd book because for those who haven't read it, it was a, a collection of columns. It really almost wasn't like writing a book. I kind of cheated because I wrote columns for TSN.ca for a period of, I don't know, 10 years and then felt that they were different enough that I actually a publisher came to me and said, why don't you put all these together in a book? So it was kind of a book about nothing and just 70 or 80 or whatever it was, different columns put together. And one of the columns was the day I almost killed two Gretzky's. And I think it was either myself or the publisher, somebody thought that was a title that would get people's attention, which it probably did. But I'm sure it's people, if people bought the book thinking that was going to be the entire story, they were a little confused and disturbed because it was only about a, a three-page story in the entire book. But I think that was the reasoning. The biggest mistake I made on that book, and you know, forgive me if you and I had this discussion before, was the cover, which I got, I heard about, I still hear about to this day. I, you know, we went and did a traditional photo shoot, so they set you up with a photographer who really knows nothing. I can tell the person knew nothing about who I was or what I did, and they took a bunch of pictures of me in a suit in my typical role, which I was comfortable with, and they were trying to find a cover shot for that, but because the title story was about golf. The day I almost killed two Gretzky's is a story of <laughs> me almost killing Walter and me on the golf course. And so they, he brought along these really goofy looking golf clothes. And right at the end of the photo shoot, literally with three minutes left, he said, why don't you put on these golf clothes and uh, we'll take a couple of photos of that. And so I put on this really ugly purple sweater and these checkered pants and he took about you know 10 pictures out of a thousand. And I was busy that year. It was, I think, the 2010 Vancouver Olympics and a bunch of things were going on. So I really wasn't paying attention to the process of them putting together the book. Sure enough, the last the book comes out and I, I, I don't know, I guess somebody sent them a, a, an email for approval. And as you probably know, by the, my, the rate that I answer emails, not very well. <laughs> I didn't see it. And sure enough, the book came out with this weird picture of me and all this, this golf gear. It didn't really make any sense to anyone. And so I got I got ripped endlessly by my my panel mates for that. So uh, that was my lesson in, in making sure you take complete control <laughs> over what's going to be in your book. I like the book. I read it. I like, you know, when you get the inside stories or just stories from people in journalism, their own kind of thing. The one thing that I was going to mention is when I bought it, I think, yeah, I bought it last Christmas. And the funny story I was going to tell you is that when the person checked it up and you got your receipt, it said, the day I almost, or the day I murdered two Gretzky's. Uh, so I was thinking, like, I, I should screenshot that and send that to James, because I definitely know that's not the name of the book. But Well, it's, it's funny, because Jay Onright used to always call it that when we were, whenever he was, I don't know if I was on his podcast or he was talking on, on TSN, he'd always call it the day I murdered two Gretzky's. So, so maybe somebody heard that or picked it up. You mentioned how you kind of cheated a little bit there with the sports articles and putting it in, but was that kind of putting your foot into the water in creating mm -hmm. the next book? Well, I, I, what happened actually was I wrote a book about Brian Kilray, who I'm sure you know from from your area, the winningest junior coach of all time, the longtime coach of the Ottawa 67s. And that was actually the first book I wrote, but it wasn't really my book. It was Killer's book. We did about 10 hours of interviews together. And it was one of those, you know, Brian by Brian Kilray with James Duffy kind of 
I just put it all together for him. And at the time that I was writing that, the publisher or my book agent, I guess, read my columns and said, why don't you do this? So it was kind of like we did it on the side while I was doing the, the Brian Kilray book. I feel like the last book I wrote, The Guy on the Left, was really the first book that I really wrote. Because the Kilray book was, you know, dictating interviews and putting them together. The Day I Almost Killed Two Gretzkys was a, a book of columns. And so The Guy on the Left was the first time that I actually had to write an actual book, sit down, start to finish. And it was by far the hardest because it, it's A, tough to write a book, B, tough to write about yourself. It's, it's weird writing about yourself. But it is also the, probably the most rewarding. And that was the book that I, I think I'm most proud of and had the most fun doing, even though it was the biggest pain in the ass. And and at least the cover makes sense on that one as well. Yeah, it was just your standard me sitting at the desk, which is probably the way most people know me. It's funny that you mentioned that because I feel like you and Jay are in this battle of who's going to come out with more books because he's got two out himself. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not a battle. I mean... I, I think I did The Day I Almost Killed Two Gretzky's, and maybe that prompted Jay to do his first book, and he was much more prolific. He did books back-to-back, -back, and I, I can't remember if his second book came out at the same time as mine or the year before or whatever it was, but we, have, we both have laughed about the fact that it's kind of ridiculous that we are two of the most prolific sports authors in the country. <laughs> but I, and I think we also both agreed that we were sick of ourselves by the end of writing uh, a couple of books about ourselves. <laughs> yeah, it's not a competition, although I'm going to kick his ass. Another one. The reason I bring it up is because, so I read Jay's book. I, I liked, uh, we, we had Jay on earlier this season as well to talk about uh, their return. And I realized through his that he interned with like much music at one point and then like later on in life he did a show with much music and i was like wow it's like the full circle i kind of use yours as almost like the holy bible of journalism for me because i i i've read it i like your stories in it like of how you kind of bring out the fun side of you know what happens when things go wrong and the one thing i laugh at in the book is when you mentioned that i guess you were interning at ctv ottawa and mm -hmm. this is how you came up with the idea of the Rubber Boots podcast is because a guy kept on phoning you and saying, do you got your rubber boots? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, thank you for those nice words. I don't I think some journalism professors, if they read it, would probably cringe. <laughs> if you consider it the holy Bible of journalism because I do a lot of things and I've done a lot of things in my career that they probably wouldn't have agreed with. <laughs> but that's OK. I, I wanted it to be, you know, you, you can't write a book like that without really being 100% honest and pouring out everything and showing all your flaws and the times that you cut corners and the, the things that you did wrong and the things that you did right. I think that's probably where the, some of the, the best, you know, I guess comedy or whatever you want to call it comes from. But the Rubber Boots guy has been like, him and the monkey, I think, have probably been the two things that have tracked me my entire career. Love Maggie uh, the monkey. Love yes. Maggie. The rubber boots guy, it's funny, like, that happened so early in my career, probably, you know, two, three years out of journalism school when I first started to do sports at, at CT, CJOH in Ottawa. And I, it was a story that I would tell some of my friends, but never really tell publicly, and then I just kind of forgot about it. And I think I was on, on the radio with a guy named Mike Hogan in Toronto, who's a, a sports radio guy. And I think he asked me one time, just on the air, you know, do you ever have you ever gotten any weird callers or or fans or anything like that? And and the rubber boots guy popped into my head, and I first told the story then. And I guess a bunch of people heard it, and I started people started coming up to me and asking me about it. And then I told it again on the Jay and Dan podcast, the earlier version, maybe the, the first version of the Jay and Dan podcast. And, and ever since then, people started tweeting about it mercilessly. And every time I'd be at a hockey game hosting. Somebody would yell, hey, are you wearing your upper boots tonight? <laughs> and, and so on and so forth. And if people listening don't understand the story, um, I don't want to tell the whole thing over again. I don't think you probably want to hear it again, Brian, but the very first episode of my podcast, or Rubens podcast, I tell that story if you want to look it up. That's not a shameless plug, but if you want to hear the story. No, that's 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 perfectly fine. I'm, I'm cool with shameless plugs. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, now the rubber boots guy, he's got a podcast named after him, and we're actually working on a song. <laughs> which I do not know why we're doing, but the funnest projects are the ones that make no sense. And so Lester McLean is on my podcast and is my musician friend who we, we do some stupid songs sometimes. 
we're actually writing a song about the rubber boots guy that's going to debut in a few weeks and I take really I sick joy out of these things <laughs> I don't know why just because they're so they're so dumb and I think Brian I grew I think I talk about this in the book I grew up in the David Letterman era and you know, you're too young for it but the early days of Letterman were really to me like the the dawn of really dumb comedy you know where he would just drop watermelons off of buildings and but the, but it was dumb brilliance and so I think I've always been that's kind of been the type of comedy that I've appreciated the most is stuff that is really stupid the guy that I look up to that kind of does a similar thing and kind of like inspires me to be a little bit of the same way is uh, Conan O'Brien that's you, you know what and that's and that's bang on and I love Conan too and that's a really fair comparison and I think Conan Conan was a an offspring of Dave in the comedy sense I really like the problem I feel for everybody your age like you saw Letterman right at the end of his career when he wasn't what he was and so it was kind of like this older guy on TV and not many people watched him but early Letterman was you know was the way you felt watching Conan in his heyday it was just just really great dumbness and I think Conan would be the first to say I think you know he was a disciple of Letterman yeah, for sure. I mean, not to sway it into a whole Conan Le- or Letterman argument or whatever chat now, but it's funny because when Conan first got announced, I think in 93 as the host, I remember his first show, he did a whole skit of him pretending to hang himself because he had to replace Letterman. And some people were like, that's a little bit dark. And I was thinking, yeah, but Letterman's a little bit dark in humor too. So. Yeah. It, it kind of, you know, most comedians are pretty dark. <laughs> that was that's the one thing I've learned along the way here is that comedians are among the the, the darkest people that I've met, and I don't know that's a that's a sort of weird paradox, I think, and maybe that's where some of the funniest stuff comes from. And uh, Jay and I have talked about this. You know, I think Jay's uh, uh, you know much more closer to a comedian than I am, and much funnier. But <laughs> both of us had very normal upbringings with no darkness or, you know, troublesome. I think all most comedians were, like, locked in a basement by some sick uncle or something like that. <laughs> I had this normal suburban upbringing, as did Jay. I think, I think we were just influenced by sitting there in our basements watching Letterman or whoever as we grew up. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the upbringing because, of course, if you listen, I'll do a cheap plug on my own podcast, is if you want to find out a little bit more about why you chose uh, or what university you went to, it was Carleton. But in the book, you mentioned that you also had the option of going to McGill. The question I didn't ask last time, but I'll ask now, is what swayed you to go to Carleton over McGill? There was a, there was a couple of things. And, you know, I, I can't. I wish I could take myself back to my head in that day when I was you know, 8, 19 years old and making that decision because it, it gets a little fuzzy. But there are two things that happened. And one was pure money. We weren't the richest family at all. And I remember getting, I didn't get a scholarship or anything to McGill. I remember getting like the bill of what residence was going to cost and everything (laughs) and feeling, you know, I think my dad probably would have paid it, but I remember being there's some trepidation there. And so uh, I was worried about that from a financial standpoint for our family. And, but secondly, I, I think what really happened is I had kind of like a, some sort of come to Jesus moment where I was going to go to McGill and play football and take phys ed and be a gym teacher. That, and that was, I was all cool with that. And then at the last second, I, I think I panicked about being a gym teacher and not having anything more ambitious. No offense to gym teachers around the world. It's a great job. But I, I guess I wanted to do something more. And I, I said to myself, okay, I'm going to go to McGill and play football for five years and be a frat boy mm-hmm. and be a gym teacher and climb the rope in perpetuity and be happy. But uh, I, I guess I, I wanted something more. And so journalism had a door that I, I don't think I could have seen all this happening. But I guess I saw the possibility of somehow being able to cover sports for a living. And, and that appealed to me and made me make my mind up. So I, I don't know... You know, which was the one that pushed me over the edge if it was, I like to think it was the latter, that that was this mature decision that I made. 
but it might have just been the money. <laughs> and my dad saying, you better stay home and go to Carlton. Now, see, the interesting thing is I, I'm a firm believer in things happen for a reason, and it's not to get too too dark here or whatnot, but I feel like you went to Carlton, then when you went to CTV Ottawa, like, you, you learned a lot at CTV Ottawa, but of course you also lost a friend in or a mentor at the same time at CTV Ottawa. So I, I feel like the favorite part that I like about the book that you mentioned in it was when he passed away, the name is just drawing a blank here now. Brian but Smith. Yeah, so when Brian Smith passed away, they kind of offered you his job, but you felt like you were going to be living in the shadows of him. Right. I want to ask you, basically... What made you feel like you were going to live in his shadow? Is it just the fact that you always felt you're going to be compared to him? Yeah, well, that's that's a really complicated question. Um, you might need a three hour podcast for it because that was probably one of the strangest and certainly saddest times of my life. I was, uh, you know, I'll just try to tell it quickly. I, I was a news reporter who wanted to do sports, and back then TSN wasn't very big, and Sportsnet wasn't around, so there weren't many jobs in sports. Basically, every TV station in the country had two sportscasters who'd been there forever, and the two guys in Ottawa were two guys named. Bill Patterson and Brian Smith. Brian Smith was a journeyman, former NHL player, and they were there, had been there forever, and were going to be there forever, so there weren't many opportunities for me. What happened one day in, uh, I think it was 1994, 1995, Brian was walking out of the station and got shot in the head, and it turned out to be a, a schizophrenic who, uh, it's a, just a crazy, bizarre story, but thought the media was sending messages through his brain and wanted to get in front of a judge. And in his sick mind, the best way to get in front of a judge was to shoot somebody. So he drove to the TV station. We were the most popular TV station in, in Ottawa and with a shotgun and, and shot the first person he recognized. And that was Brian, who just finished his sports cast and, and came out. And, and Brian passed away the next day. And that was my first sports cast I did, unfortunately, was the day that Brian passed away. And it will always be the hardest thing that I ever did because Billy, his partner, was just a mess. And so they needed someone to do the sports. And that whole cliche about the show must go on, which sounds silly, but I kind of believed that at the time that Brian would have wanted a sports cast. And so we did it. And, and you're right. I moved. I did move into the sports department then. So I basically Billy replaced Brian on the six o'clock and I replaced Billy on the 11 o'clock. And uh, we, Billy and I worked together for a couple of years, and it was it was fantastic. It was part of the best time of my life, and Billy was a real mentor to me as well, Billy Patterson. But I, I did never feel right. I think what you were getting at there is bang on. I never felt right about that being my break. It was so weird that all my life I wanted to be a sportscaster, and then, you know, that's the way you get your break is by one of your friends and guys you looked up to um, getting killed, it, it it just bothered me, and it kind of ate away at me for these couple of years. And so, finally, I decided I just I just had to leave. That I just couldn't be the guy who replaced Brian for the rest of my career. So I actually took another news job, the first one I could get in Vancouver, and left. Even though I didn't want to leave sports, but I just I needed to get away from that situation. And I was you know fortunate enough that TSN called me. I think six months later. But yeah, you're right. That was just weird. And you know, I, I talk about that in the book, and I talk about, uh, you know, there's many times you get you get breaks in all sorts of ways. The first job I got when I was at Carleton was because I did an internship over there, and then one of the reporters broke his rib skiing. <laughs> it happened to be happened on the day after I finished my internship, and so I was fresh in their mind. And so these things happen, these weird things in your life, and I think you could say I've gotten really, really lucky, although I don't I don't consider the Brian Smith thing lucky. I, it was just, just very very odd sad way to to have your career uh, move forward so uh, that's I guess I don't know if I explained it well but that's the best way I can explain why I never felt right about the whole thing no like I, I think you did an excellent job there explaining it like I agree when I was reading it in the book I was thinking to myself like I, I underlined it I was like looking over it, and I'm like this is kind of like that inspired me in the sense of when you get a job you want it from your own credibility you don't want it just because of a, an event that happened that got you right. that gig. You know, this is a weird business, though, because, you know, so many things are... Later on, when I got the hockey job, which I also talk about in the book, they had actually hired somebody else. When when TSN got the rights back for hockey in, I think, 2002, 
they hired a the first female host ever uh, to to be a national TV host in, in Canada and made a big deal out of it. And then basically two days before the season started, uh, they decided she wasn't ready. She decided she wasn't ready, and and they called me. And so you know, basically 24 hours before mm-hmm. the season, I, I I became the hockey host at PSN. So uh, I guess <laughs> I guess you could say my entire career is based on uh, weird ass luck, but. Yeah, it's it, it's funny the way the way that is. I suppose in in and maybe in journalism as as much as any other place in the world. No, I I, I agree. I, I just like reading people's stories and like seeing like you know not everything is especially with journalism or you know yourself or other journalists out to like Lisa Laflamme to hear their stories. It's kind of interesting because there's never really a dull moment like i look at it too and i mean i'm only 26 but my i guess this will be it's either going to make you angrier or make you kind of look at how you deal with publicity because when i was at loyalist you were doing the homecoming for carlton yeah, i remember i remember meeting it that day in the, in the rain outside the, the now, Carlton. now the funny story here is and this is the part where you might get mad or might just look and say like oh, i gotta do better with my publicists but i had emailed Carlton a week prior and said I'm coming back for homecoming I'd like to interview James Duthie and they were basically telling me he's only here to do the the drop or the the coin toss and then he's gone and I was thinking like I was thinking like oh yeah, I'm so hard to get a team of handlers which by the way is me <laughs> so like and and I th- I said to myself like okay I was like that's that's fair if he's only there for the coin toss I totally understand it but I'm like you know what I'm gonna be there I'm just gonna take the shot and see if I can meet him and then you were out there talking to people and then I was like the worst thing he can do is say no I'm not doing the interview and go back to the school and say what are you doing sending these kids out to interview me and, I, and then it'd be like he doesn't even go here so well, I hope first of all I, I, it bothers me that they would do that I guess they're trying to protect me somehow but that's just ridiculous i mean i definitely would have said yes to the interview if he'd somehow gotten a hold of me but uh look at the, the thing about it, i chuckle because it's canada what grade if there's a grade celebrities and b grade celebrities what what grade of celebrity is a canadian cable sportscast and it's not it's not like there was going to be 500 young journalism students who all wanted to interview me i think it was you and that was, that was basically it I think you've learned from your times to get a hold of me that I'm terrible. Like I'm, I'm horrible with email. Literally horrible. Like sometimes I'll check it every two weeks and, and I'll forget. And I think it took me about you know six months to ever get back to you. But uh, I'm glad we finally hooked up. And that's the thing that I kind of look at too, because you know it's it's a weird medium in communications, especially by email, because you don't want to come across of sending two or three a day or two or three a week because you don't know what their vibe is with some people. They might not see it. They might see it and just be like, I'm not getting back to that person. So like when I sent, I think one in October or September, I was like, oh, he'll reply pretty quickly. And then I was like, okay, he didn't. Then I'm like, well, I'm, I'm going to give it a little bit of time before just assuming that he'd seen it and didn't reply. Uh, you could always do, I would say the, uh, the second follow-up is always a very, that's good etiquette and that's probably a good idea with me. And you know, some people are, some people are just uh, dog on bone. Yeah. Maybe that is. Sometimes that is the way you have to be. I, I don't think that would work with me. If you send me twenty emails, I might tell you to get lost. Yeah. But I know there's a guy, particularly in radio. There's a guy I know who's one of the toughest jobs is the, the producers in radio who have to constantly phone to try to get guests for the shows. And and there's a guy in Toronto. I won't say his name, but he just is relentless. And I remember he called, I think it was either Steve Young, I think it was Steve Young. He had this incredible Rolodex that he got from someone, so he had everybody's name. And he, he called Steve Young apparently like 30 times in a 24-hour period. And eventually Steve Young said, look, I will come on your show, just never call me again. <laughs> so I guess it worked for him, but I don't, I don't think I could ever do that because I'm... Trust me, I'm the same way even now. I don't like bothering people. I hate bothering people with anything. And so I could never be one of those guys. Thank goodness I have a good job because, and I always feel for everybody in journalism and and students like yourself working their way up because you kind of do have to be that way. If you want a TV job, you kind of have to keep knocking on the doors of the news directors because they are, they do have busy lives and things do get lost. My problem is I get, you know, 300 emails a day and... I'm really bad about cleaning up the box. So it's not that I'm ignoring you. It's I will literally lose it. 
And that's going to do it for this episode of Tobin Tonight. Our thanks to James Duffy for coming on the show. Remember, you can find past, present, and future episodes on TobinTonight.com, Spotify, and iTunes. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and leave a comment or two. For Tobin and myself, this is Jacob saying, If James Duffy is the captain or godfather of TSN, who are his alternatives? Let us know below. Thanks for listening, and good night.